Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm mic'd up twice, so that should be fun. Uh, thank you to Dali as well as to the SSI students. It is a privilege and an honor to be with you here today. I am just going to tell my story. Um, yes, I've been doing this in terms of uh, speaking with regards to Israel for about two years, but it didn't always start this way. And so what I thought would be interesting to do this evening is just to let you know why I do what I do and some of the lessons that I've learned along the way and hopefully that that will inspire you most of all irrespective of what may be going on with regards to the Palestinians and the Israelis to be inspired to seek for the truth. We live in a culture, we live in an era where if it's popular everybody's going to run around behind it and many times we have no idea what we're running after behind and we can't exist like that if we're really going to make an impact in any way. So um, I've titled my talk this evening, Zionism and I, and even though we're going to have Q&A at the end, you're more than welcome to raise your hands, ask me questions. I'm still learning as well. And the opportunity to learn from people for, like you who are on the ground at an institution as glorious as Columbia University would be an honor for me. Daisy International, like Dalia introduced me as, is actually an organization that my father started. I knew of this Israel country father in the Middle East. I'm a Christian, and so as a Christian, we got brought up with the Bible. You've got to pray for Israel. You've got to love Israel. And then Dad comes home, and he's like, we have to start this organization because he was in America, and he saw this BDS. And BDS saying that Israel is an apartheid state. He was fuming angry. I'll never forget. He calls a family around the table, and he was like, if there's going to be a response, yes, the world is responding. If there's going to be a response, it has to come from South Africans because we went through apartheid, and it has to come from black South Africans. Olga's immediate response, it's not our problem. Dad, you're too busy. I'm too busy. They can sort themselves out. We will continue to pray. That, that was me. And he was like, no, I don't care. You're going to do this. And you're coming on board because I'm actually an attorney back at school, but I'm an attorney. And he's like, we need your legal skills. So I'm like, oh, fine. So I begrudgingly get on the board of Daisy International. And then I started to read. And I started to take an interest in terms of what really is going on. I started to pay more attention with regards to the world and international news. And, and then the more I dug and the more I learned, I was like, name, man, something's office here. And then it was Operation Protective Edge. I had my first speaking engagement, and the long story is I was hooked. And ladies and gents, primarily hooked for two reasons. One, my passion to see justice being done, justice for all people. And secondly, my passion for Africa. And so I'm going to start my conversation with you this morning, I mean this evening. It does feel like morning. Um, it's been one of those days. In terms of explaining why Zionism, with regards to my heritage as an African, my nationality as a South African, my faith, my now, and my future. Here we have, ladies and gents, the map of Africa. Anybody identify Wakanda? <laughs> it is a fictional, <laughs> it is a fictional country. Um, I saw a post today, real story, Uber driver. Oh my gosh, because somebody who's from Burundi got into the cab, was like, where are you from? He's like, I'm from Burundi, is it near Wakanda? I watched it, it's a fantastic country. He's like, yes, it's from Wakanda. It's okay, but ladies and gents, Africa, an incredible continent. Do you know that in the end of the year 2010, it was recorded that Africa exported minerals as well as fuel to the value of 333 billion US dollars. That is seven times more in exports, legal exports, might I add. That is seven times more in exports than Africa received with regards to external help. Africa, ladies and gents, supplies the world with more than 50% of the world's diamonds. We supply the world with more than 25% of the world's gold and 6.5% of natural gas. But when people talk about poverty and disease and hunger, corruption, who do they speak of primarily? Africa. 18 of the world's poorest countries out of the top 25, ladies and gents, are found on that continent, on my continent. This is where I come from, right at the bottom. My continent. But that wasn't always the case. And standing here before you as a young woman who knows that her African continent, as she's being portrayed now and as she's living now, is not the Africa that she can be. Go back to the 1950s and 1970s, 
And when you look at countries such as the Congo, Ethiopia, and Uganda, what do you find? You find Israeli technology helping those countries with regards to agriculture, medicine, and business. Cross over to Tanzania, Chad, Nigeria, what do you find? Engineering, Israeli engineering that assists with airports, the building of highways, universities, massive construction going on. If that's not enough, and these are just a few of these countries, Ghana, Malawi, Cote d'Ivoire, Israel was declared their number one friend from the very first day of their independence from colonization. The Zambian Kwacha was stronger than the US dollar and equal to the British pound. Then what happened? If you're a person of faith, you'll look at Genesis 12:3, where Hashem says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. If you look at world facts, what also happens, and you can link the two. All right, I understand from Danny we're approaching midterms, and um, what happens in midterms, or at least in my life with midterms, is you get into study groups, and so you're all sweated out together. Now imagine having a study group where somebody promises you, I'll come and study with you, and you know that you want to be in their study group because they know what they're doing. But then somebody else comes and says, no, 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 don't study with them. I promise I'll help you. And if I help you, then I'm going to give you X, Y, and Z. So you're like, okay, I won't study with, what's your name, sweetheart? Tara. I'm not going to study with Tara. Okay, I'm not going to study with Tara. I'm going to rather study with Dahlia. Because she promises that she's going to help me with that. But oh, she's like top of her class. I want to be with her. She knows what she's doing. Uh, but because we grew up, I'm going to go with her. A week before midterm comes, she doesn't show up at our appointed study time. Two days before... The night before, she doesn't show up. Ladies and gents, that's pretty much what the Arab leaders and the Arab nations did to Africa. Why do I say so? There's this relationship that's working and that's prospering with Israel. The Arab nations come along, and you can go read this in your history books of the 1970s. Promises were made. You've got to do this. Don't do this. The oil embargo threats. I'm not going to go into all of the details because it's not a history lesson tonight. But the ties were cut. And what do we have happening on the African continent, ladies and gents? An African continent that desperately needs food, desperately needs water, agriculture, a system of tourism, and so much more, and it's not happening. So when all of these accusations happen with regards to, to Israel, and I'll come with regards to is everything that's right, or rather is Israel always right? No. I'm not here to stand and say that Israel is absolutely perfect. She is not. And we'll talk about, it, we'll talk about that a little bit better. But... When all of this hoo-ha is being made, my question as an African is, what happens to all of Africa's challenges? Because so many world organizations, including the UN, they do amazing work. But when we look at their conversation with regards to Africa, I mean, with regards to the world, it's just Israel, Israel, Israel. And I'm like, what happens to Africa's challenges? Anybody want to take a guess where that picture's from? Sir? Sir? Uh, yes, sir, but what do you think is happening? Um, some sort of immigration push, uh, the fall of a boat, and uh, they're trying to get to Europe from here? They are trying to get to Europe, but more so they're fleeing. Who's heard of the Libyan slave trade? Yeah, uh, no, in the north. Um, uh, I think Yemen had a ceasefire for a little bit. Only last week. I was just about to ask, how long did that piece last? Maybe two weeks. And it's still if that, if that... We all went on Instagram, all of us, I'm generalizing, but the world goes on Instagram, the world goes on Facebook, and makes a hoo-ha, yay, yay, yay. After years afterwards, I mean, years after this has already been happening, and then they move on to the next subject matter. Ladies and gents, you can find a well-bodied, a well-abled black African man, purchase him as a slave for $200. Today, open-air slave market. I as an African say, okay, but then what about our problems? What about our challenges there? Anybody remember this? Bring back our girls. Hashtag movement. And yes, I'm being very sarcastic because I feel very passionate about this. How long did that last? How many of those girls have they found? Anybody know that there was a kidnapping of over 100 girls just this last week? Yeah. And then? So as an African, I'm like, okay, world, well, ho hold up a bit. Hold, just hold up. When there's a nation and when there are nations that are wanting to help us with regards to terrorism, Israel, before Boko Haram kidnapped those girls initially, Israel offered assistance with regards to intelligence, and the assistance was turned down for various reasons, which we won't go into now. 
So a country where ISIS has said, and this was told by a reporter who fled ISIS, they gave him, they accommodated him for a while and then they told him to leave, that the only country in the world that ISIS fears is, is Israel. And if Israel's saying, hey, we're willing to help, my hand's going to go up and say, okay, let me learn more about this nation that says that they can help my people. My nationality, I've already told you that I'm South African. And when many people learn about South Africa, they think about the rainbow nation and the beautiful people that she is, and she is beautiful. And I say that if there's any country that you need to come to, after America, of course, but if there's any country that you need to come to, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's Africa. Listen to me talking like an international. Excuse me, Africa's not a country. If there's any country that you need to come to, it's South Africa on the continent of Africa. Why? Because there are so many different cultures that exist there. Beautiful people, beautiful hospitality, the most amazing food. And I'm not just saying it because I come there, I'm saying it because it's the truth. But you think of South Africa and you think unity and you think Nelson Mandela and you think culture and color. And then you also think this many a times. I've been asked to say, but Olga, why do South African black students in particular, South Africans generally, why do they support Israel? with regards to, why do they support Israel Apartheid Week with regards to the accusations that, that are made? My response is, I also would support them. I absolutely would. If I were to see pictures like this, and you were going to tell me that the same injustices that were perpetuated against my people, against black people, for over 50 years was happening in another country, morally, yes, we've got a right. And morally, yes, we've got an obligation to stand up and make some noise and say that this is wrong, because it is wrong. How dare you separate and judge people based solely on the color of their skin? How dare you? But there's a problem. Because if you look at the facts, and this is one of the things that I started to do, that's one of the things that I challenge people to do, is unpack the facts, understand what the definition of apartheid is, understand whether or not that is happening in Israel, and come to a decision. And ladies and gents, Israel is not an apartheid state, and as a black South African who lived there, and as a black South African who still, with certain respects, experiences the evils of an institutionalized system that was there, I can very confidently and very truthfully say it doesn't exist. On that note, I'd like for us just to watch a video for two seconds. Actually, before we go there, I found this just before, in fact, after I sent my first um, presentation to Dahlia. Ladies and gents, this is an example of a permit back in the day. I literally found it three hours ago. There were different types of permits because people like to say that Israel is an apartheid state because they need um, papers in order to cross the security wall and the apartheid wall. Not going to go into that tonight. But here's a real life example. And if you want a copy of this afterwards, can get it to you. I'm going to read it to you because the writing is a little bit small. So it is addressed to a Mrs. Hannah and it is in regards to the area of the land, the Glen Country Club in Camps Bay. And what is this permit for? It says to enable 18 members of the colored group named on the reverse of the permit to occupy together with white people on the 24th of February 1974 on the occasion of a wedding reception. So colored people, black people have to get permission to hang out with white people at a wedding reception. However, there are certain conditions. The conditions are that the coloreds mentioned may only come as coloreds and have their own separate area at the wedding reception. And they are not allowed to participate in any dancing that may take place. Just but one of the various types of permits, ladies and gents, that existed during Apartheid South Africa. By law, by law, I can tell you story after story with regards to real life examples that happened. And my challenge to anybody is go to Israel and find if that's happening. And if it is happening, well then Israel is an apartheid state. But ladies and gents, it's not happening. Because what happens is ladies and gents, these are black South Africans themselves, youngsters and old people, who will, from their experiences, it's about three minutes, four minutes long, that'll tell you whether or not Israel is an apartheid state.
president of the UC system is a Zionist Jew, and he supports the apartheid state of Israel. When I hear that Israel is an apartheid state, when people make that accusation, depending on the mood that I'm in on the day, I either pack out laughing or I get really, really angry because it's an absolute lie. Right now, if you say Israel is an apartheid state, I won't believe you because I've been to Israel and it was awesome. We're South Africans, so we know what apartheid is. You know, I was born under apartheid. I grew up and lived under apartheid. So when people talk about apartheid, they can't tell me things I do not know. I've been to Israel almost about 14 times, and I've checked Israel from all corners. I've looked at what's happening in the legislature, in the Knesset. I've looked at what's happening in the streets, and I've concluded that what happened in the South Africa that was under the apartheid government does not exist in Israel. When people say Israel is an apartheid state, I don't understand what they're talking about, because I've lived in apartheid. I understand those laws that were reinforced. I saw practical. I've been a member of parliament, the South African parliament, for the last 21 years. During apartheid in South Africa, you could never have black people in the, in the parliament. Black people were not even allowed to vote. You go to Israel, you find members of the Knesset who are Arabs and Muslims, members of the Knesset who speak against their own government. In South Africa during apartheid, when black people spoke against their government, they were charged for treason. We couldn't go to the same schools. We couldn't use the same hospitals. In Israel, you have Arabs lying in hospital next to a Jew. In Israel, you have people mingling on the streets, sitting on the same benches. In South Africa, you had signs. Whites only sit here. Whites only drink from this fountain. Israel doesn't say that because you are not Jewish, you can't go to the beach. Israel doesn't say because you're non-Jewish, you can't go and watch a movie. When we had an apartheid state, when we were in apartheid, that's what they said. You couldn't interact, you couldn't watch movies, you couldn't go to the beach, you couldn't shop in a, 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 like a big supermarket if you were black during apartheid. I've been to Israel four times and I can say from my experience that what the media depicts about Israel is not true, it's not real, you know. Uh, the hostility that is said about the people of Israel is not there, you know. If anything, they're very warm, friendly, loving people. Israel was awesome, everything about it, from the people, the food, the place, the atmosphere there, it's beautiful. Before I went to Israel, I was expecting what I always see in the media. I was expecting to see a lot of shootings, bombings, and yeah, a lot of, a lot of conflict. But when I went there, um, I actually saw the opposite. There was so much um, peace. You go into the Tel Aviv, <laughs> and you see so many young people actually having fun. There's a lot of sentiment and business acumen that comes from Israel, for me, which kind of tells me that there's something really important happening there. As a black person, to actually find out the truth is to be like, you're taking something so painful for black South Africans and mispresenting it for either publicity, for directed hate, and then repackaging it and saying it's apartheid, not cool. If the BDS and everybody else that's on their side was trying to actually accomplish something that was gonna give hope, that was gonna give life, that was gonna encourage peace, you know, maybe let's have a conversation on that. But how dare you take that and use it to incite violence, and use it to incite and encourage the destruction of a people just because you don't like them. It's, it's disgusting. And the world needs to recognize that you are not only doing an injustice to the people that are in the Middle East, you are making what our parents went through, you're making the struggle a mockery. When you look at what happened, was happening in a lot of Arabic countries in terms of black people, we find them being oppressed. And, and nobody's paying attention to that or bringing that to light. And, and that brings to me, or says to me, that there's bias reporting. Don't take the, what you're being fed. Don't take what you read in newspapers. Don't take what you read, or what you see on news, rather. Go there and, and, and educate yourself. Open a book, a history book. Open a current book. Open anything that actually speaks truth. I got an opportunity to actually go to Israel and, and seek truth for myself, if I can say that. And it was mind-boggling to see just the misconceptions and just how it doesn't add up to what we see on TV. To my brothers and sisters, specifically in South Africa and specifically like me that are black, 
This war is real. It's a war for our history. It's a war for another nation's survival. There was once a time when people didn't want us to exist, when they didn't believe that we had a right to anything. And if we really want to do justice to our legacy, to do justice to the challenges that we were able to overcome, then we'll not only want to stand in solidarity with Israel and with the truth, but frankly with any nation that's under threat across the world. The one thing I always advise guys is wisdom is free. And that's what for me Israel kind of represents, is, is, is that wisdom, is that ancient wisdom. Wisdom where you can really plug into a system that works. So if you ask me, uh, why, why Israel? I'd say, why not Israel? We need to look at this as it is. And not be told a lie that's not there. I wanted you, thank you. The reason why I wanted you to watch that is that's a group of youngsters coming from different places and older people as well, who from their own personal experiences in South Africa have come to their own conclusions from their own readings, ladies and gents, that the Israel that is portrayed in the media, the Israel that is portrayed as being an apartheid state is not. So the challenge that I then have as a black South African is how dare you, and I say it in that film, that short film, how dare you take my nation's history and manipulate it in order to accomplish your own political agenda. Like, how, how dare you? This was the BDS logo banner that they used last year. You immediately see that. What does that do to you inside? It draws anger. Like, how dare they treat the children like that? These children just want to hope. They just want a better future. Of course they do. And that's also part of the reason as to why I do what I do. It's an absolute lie that in order to want to see the true liberation of the Palestinian people, the true liberation of the Palestinian children, that you have to be anti-Israel. If you really love them, if you really want to see their liberation, if you really want to see human rights increase, grow, not just in Israel but across the Middle East, ladies and gents, then you will want to see the conversation, move away from just total bias with regards to Israel, and involve all parties that are around the table, including leaders of the Palestinian people, and I won't go into there tonight, that are the main perpetrators of the abuses that are experienced by their own people. My now. But before I go there, a picture of a very famous man, our former president, Nelson Mandela. When people have the conversation with regards to Israel and the Palestinian people, they like to quote this, and he did indeed say this. We know too well that our freedom, he's talking about South Africa, is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinian people. How many of you have heard that statement being bashed around? And it's true. It's right. There needs to be the freedom of the Palestinian people. What's interesting, though, is I'm sure they haven't shown you this line from his speech before. I cannot conceive of Israel withdrawing if Arab states do not recognize Israel within secure borders. He said that. Nelson Mandela also said, if you want to make peace with your enemy, you have to work with your enemy, then he becomes your partner. Nelson Mandela said, and this he said when he went to Israel. So when people say, don't you dare go to Israel, and they tell that to the people in my country, and I'm like, ah, oh, reverse apartheid. Because during the apartheid system, they told us as black people where we could go and where we couldn't go. And now in democracy, you still want to tell me where I can go, where I can't go. But nonetheless, President Mandela went to Israel because he wanted to see it for himself. And that's what I challenge absolutely anybody to do, everybody to do. Go and see it for yourself. And once you've seen, ladies and gents, once you've done your own homework, absolutely, then come to a conclusion of your own. So he goes to Israel, the whole world is hana, 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 hanning. And he was like, hold up. To, air, to, many, to the many people who have questioned why I came, I say Israel worked very close with the apartheid regime. I say I've made peace with many men who slaughtered our people like animals. There's a difference between working with their regime and there were some parts where Israel did and they made rights. There were many nations, including the U.S., that did some stuff, but then also that helped us. Okay? But Nelson Mandela says we've made peace with men who slaughtered, slaughtered, killed, butchered, South African people like animals. Israel cooperated with the apartheid regime, but it did not participate in any atrocities.
He also said, Great anger and violence can never build a nation. We are striving to proceed in a manner towards a result which will ensure that all our people, both black and white, emerge as victors. I had a conversation the other day when somebody challenged me with regards to the apartheid na um, narrative, and I said, okay, fine, forget what they were saying or what you want to say. Let's look at the process that was followed. When President Nelson Mandela, or he wasn't president then, but in the liberation movement, how did they behave? How did they react? How did they respond? Ladies and gents, one of the main things, they understood the rules of international law. You don't go for innocent children. You don't go for innocent civilians. Look at the attitude that he's espousing as he's speaking. It's like great anger and violence can never build a nation. We are striving to proceed in a manner towards a result which will ensure all, that all our people, both black and white, emerge as victors. Is that the same attitude that is being brought to the table from the other side? No. So if we want to follow then the same route, if that's what people want to do, well then let's do it the same way. So don't use my history and then twist it and manipulate it so that you get your own way. My faith. If you look at statistics, ladies and gentlemen, in Iraq, Iran, Syria, many other nations, also in the Middle East, Christianity, a lot of other religions apart from Islam, are in the decline. Israel, the only place where religions can practice openly. You can be who you want to be, what you want to be, where you want to be. doesn't mean you're going to be popular, but there's a difference between popularity and living. I would rather publicly share my faith, be unpopular with a few people, but rather live. You're welcome to Google on the internet. You'll see today executions of Christians, Christians being burnt on a stake. Why? Purely because of their faith. In Bethlehem, Early 1980s, 56% of the population there were Christians. Any guesses as to how many today? It's around five. The West Bank overall, two. People complain about the fact that Israel is a Jewish state. True, but what's the population of the Jewish state? How many people comprising the Jewish state are Arabs or Muslim? How much percentage? Yes, ma'am. Close on 25%. Ladies and gents, if we're talking about democracy and freedom of religion in the Middle East, then let's have the full-on conversation. So because I want to be in a place and I want to take care of my brothers and sisters and advocate for their peace and security in the Middle East, then absolutely I want them to be in a place where they will be able to freely worship as they want to. And that place, ladies and gents, is Israel. My now and my future. We talk about universal human rights. These two pictures, and again, ladies and gents, all of this information is widely available if you just go and study and read. Freedom of speech, pretty much non-existent in Gaza. Picture of a man being dragged behind. How dare you open up your mouth and say something that's not befitting with regards to the narrative of the ruling government there. Democracy. Mohammed Abbas. When was he elected into power? For how many terms? How long was his initial term? How many years? For four years. So let's talk democracy. Let's talk human rights. Let's just talk the basics of the basics. So we've got a leader who was elected for, four year, for a four-year term who's now going into his 12 years. Why aren't we talking about that? Why aren't we calling that into account? The billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of rands that are being given to the Palestinian people for their liberation, for a better life. Where are those billions landing up? Apart from tunnels, they're landing in the back pockets, ladies and gents. And again, this information is freely available. This information is the stuff that I started to discover. And I was like, but hang on, wait a minute. This isn't fair. It's not fair. So you don't even have to like Israel. If you love the Palestinian people, then you should be asking and saying, but where is all of the money going to? Why is that leader worth 2.6 billion US dollars? Why? Why is another leader worth over 100 million dollars? Why? Where is the money going to? You care about human rights? Well, then care about ensuring that the money goes to where it's supposed to go care about making sure that the people get the livelihoods that they want to get. Their leaders aren't giving them what they deserve. 
But what are they doing? Masking it with the fact that it's Israel, it's Israel, it's Israel, it's Israel's fault. Ladies and gents, again, Israel is not perfect. No country in the world is perfect. So let's hold it to a standard that we hold all other nations of the world, but at the same time, let's hold these leaders accountable. For as long as we just go on and hop on, the whole Israel is wicked and da-da-da-da, then we lose sight of the fact that there are people who really need our voices too. Human rights. I saw a statistic this morning that made me hurt. In the last three years in Nigeria, 16,000 Christians have been killed. That's 15 murders a day. You care about human rights. You, hear, you care about human rights? Well, then let's examine these two as well. And again, the United Nations does a lot of amazing things. We're looking at the issue here with regards to Israel and the Palestinian people. UNRWA, how many people know how many, um, what they're responsible for? Okay, apart from the two in the front. Yes, sir. They're responsible for schools. They do. They are responsible for schools. Schools of whom? Of which people? Of the Palestinian people. This is a UN organ solely responsible for the well-being of the Palestinian people. That's all they do. Schools, housing, all of those things, which all people deserve. Five million people is what now the count is in terms of refugee. The refugee agency, ladies and gents, is responsible for the rest of the world. My continent, because that's my first priority. 18 million refugees. Well, those are the latest stats that I got. I could be wrong. But those are the stats that I was looking at this morning. 18 million, and that's 25% of the people that they're responsible for. So overall, we've got 72 million, 5 million. 72 million, 5 million. My question is, is that fair? And then I also ask and say, okay, but hang on, you were started in the year 1949. At that time, there were approximately 860, 900,000 Palestinian refugees. And today, there are 5 million? But you were started to take care of them and make sure that they're okay and they're no longer refugees so if the number's going up let's just talk business because i'm now in school for business your boss says listen i i've got nine hundred thousand people that need help i'm setting up an ngo or an mpo to take care of them you bring him a report that a couple of years later over 50 years later um uh, you know the challenge that we had with the the nine hundred thousand eight hundred. Well, you see, um, it's increased to five m million. How? Why? They've got budget upon budget upon budget, ladies and gents. Why aren't we asking these questions? If we say that we care, if we say that we're really interested in human rights again, then why why aren't we caring? Again, let's go back to the Libyan slave trade. That existed for how many weeks on social media? Now nothing. Syria today. Statistics, we're looking at 12 million Syrians that are displaced. 12 million. Yes, sir. Not to go into it, because we can have a total separate discussion on this. How many of us have heard of the Mizrahi Jews and the Mizrahi refugees? How many refugees are there now? None. How much money did they receive at that time? None. Ladies and gents, these are the questions that we should be having. Outside of it, just ask the basics and say, okay, I care about human rights. Uh-huh, you care about human rights. Okay, let's put the facts on the table. Because for so long as we continue to argue, it about, argue about the situation up here, the people that really need it continue to suffer. Syria, let me repeat that figure for you again. 12 million. 12 million. Ladies and gents, it's not fair. Another reason why I do what I do, contribution to humanity. You cannot, you cannot take away, again, like Israel or not, you can't take away the fact that in counterterrorism they are superior. I'm tired of the terrorism that's happening on my continent. I'm tired of it. 
If there's a country that says, we can help you, I need help, my country needs help, we'll take the help. Cybersecurity, truth, dialogue, democracy, innovation, and hope. Cape Town, South Africa, a beautiful city on the coast. We had D-Day in April. Thank God they've moved it out to July. I pray that we never get there. What is D-Day? There's no water, not a drop of water, nada, nix, nothing. Now I'm talking my own language. Okay, no, no, I don't understand. And if you don't have water, what does that impact? Food, what does that impact? Sanitation, what does that impact? Health. And then there's technology and people that can help us, and we're saying we're not going to help. People must, people must die. Again, in my country, many of the cultures, particularly the Kosa culture, there's a season with which the boys go and they get circumcised. They're 13 years old. Not the fact that it hurts only, but many of them don't come back. They don't come back because they die. But Israel has this gadget, prefix, very sterile, very easy to use, that can save lives. Yeah, yeah, politics, don't like Israel, forget about our people. Yeah, I have a problem with that. I have a serious problem with that. Again, contribution to humanity, all of these things, we've got Israel and Israeli technology to say thank you for. If it weren't for them, ladies and gentlemen, whether we like it or not. One of my favorite things, I love it, is when they organize protests on Facebook and protests on boycotts. Yay, BDS, yay. Uh, start with everything else there. I put up a status the other day. Ladies and gents, boycott Black Panther as well. Why? The creators of Black Panther were two Jewish men. This movie that is giving people like me such hope. Well, I've always had hope, but inspiration to be like, oh my gosh, there's somebody who's a superhero and who can do amazing things on those strong women, whether you're a black woman or just a woman, you can see this woman doing this. All these characters, ladies and gents, the Jewish people, the land of Israel has given us so much, so much. Let's take a step back and have a conversation and be like, okay. With their problems, let, let's, let's talk this out. Let's have a little bit of dialogue here. They have given us so much. Wherever you may go and whatever we do, ladies and gents, there's Zionism. There's a piece of it in every single one of us. If you look at your faith, if you look at your culture, if you look at, your, if you look at um, governance and, and you look at technology and, and you look at education and schools, in every single one of us, whether we like it or not, I'm a proud African. I'm as proud as I come. But ladies and gents, I know that within my DNA, there's a part of Zionism in me. I've got Israel to thank for a lot of things. And because of what she's done for my people back in the day, what she wants to do for my people now, especially when there are lies that are being told against her, you better believe that I'm going to stand up and say something. And that's my encouragement to you. Many a times and specifically those of you, and I'm going to speak to you specifically that are Jews or that are of, Ra are of Israeli descent, are like, but what do we do? People hate us just because of the fact that we're Jewish, just because of the fact that we're Israeli. There really is no hope. Like, let's just shut up and go back. And my conversation to you is don't give up. Going back to the statement that I made earlier when I'm asked and people say, but why do particularly black South Africans, just jump on the bandwagon. And they participate in these marches that are just about demonizing and that are hurtful. I'm like, half of them just don't know. They just don't know. And those that do know, bless their stupid hearts, move on. But there are so many other individuals, ladies and gents, that just don't know. So in your conduct, in your livelihood, in your, in, in your living life, and in your contribution, continue to contribute. And in that way, then you'll win us over and win the world over. President Mandela again said, when people are determined, they can overcome absolutely anything. Who is that? No? She's an alumni of the school. And I, I can't show that the video is on here, but I won't be able to show it to you. Savanya Ari, she founded 
and is currently still the CEO of an organization called Innovation Africa. Even that name makes me happy. Even that name, Innovation Africa, she realized and was like, okay, there's a challenge in Africa. And as she went through the different challenges, she realized that the challenge of access to water and the ability then to go to school and all of these things can be solved with technology that uses the sun's power, solar technology, that can then pump water, get water, so that girls can go to school instead of walking for miles and then coming back home. People can drink clean water. And what Innovation Africa is doing, under her leadership, an Israeli, an alumni of Columbia University, found a solution and is giving back the people of Africa and saying, here are the tools, you do it yourself. In a short number of years, they have impacted one million African lives. And it's not a, the th one of the things that I love about Innovation Africa is that they didn't come and step in and be like, okay, you're going to do it our way, and we're going to stay here for forever so that you can depend on us for forever. Because sometimes people do that. They want to help, but it's like, do it our way. Thank you, but no thank you. It was a case of, okay, here are the tools, stepping out, we'll help you, we'll monitor it as we need to, and impacting one million lives. A student from Columbia, Columbia University and an Israeli impacting Israel in that regard. In closing off, I just want to leave you with three of the things that she said. Sometimes good is not good enough. One of the things that she said and how she was looking at Africa's challenges and saying, but how can I help? She said, how can I help? Then they're like, okay, let's bring water. But then they realized that they weren't bringing the water fast enough. Then they looked at the sun and she was like, if we had just stopped and said, yay, we're giving them water. That was good. It was like, good isn't good enough. What more can we do? How can we think harder and dream harder and speak harder, ladies and gents, even in your conversations, even in life generally, sometimes we wake up and be like, I've had a good day. A good day is a good day. You've done a good deed for somebody else, but sometimes good is not good enough. We've got to do more. The second thing that she said, sometimes the source of the problem is also the source of the solution. Many a times, people have got their own issues when they have conversations with you. They have their own issues in life. And then when they come to you, they're challenging that anger and, and that bitterness or that, that ignorance, whatever they, they may be carrying. But if you understand where they're coming from, you may be able to win a friend. Quick story with regards to what happened to me on my university campus. The first time that I really, really, really experienced racism, so I had racism while growing up, but in my face one-on-one, -on -one, up until then, it was as a community, as a family, right? When you go places and you see how people treat you. Um, I was at university and it was, so at that time, apartheid had ended, but there were still racist incidents on campus and it was elections for students, uh, student leadership. And they were handing out flowers to all the girls. And I went up and I wanted a flower and they were like, no, you can't have a flower. And I was like, why? They were like, because you're black. I was like, <laughs> Oh, okay. And that's m of many stories that I can tell you. But cut long story short, I was elected onto the student council. And ladies and gents, by learning, making the effort to learn the Afrikaans language, because I realized that they were feeling threatened. Now it's the dem you know, democratic South Africa. Nobody likes the white people anymore. Nobody likes Afrikaans. They were feeling threatened. So what did Olga do? I learned their language and I spoke to them in Afrikaans. Can I tell you that I could call a meeting at 6 a.m. and I would have the most Afrikaans young men come to my meetings. Why? Because they realize that actually there's something in us that she's interested in. So sometimes the source of the problem is also the source of the solution. And then lastly, with privilege comes responsibility. Those of us that know have an obligation and a responsibility to tell somebody else, to invite them to functions, to invite them to various opportunities to learn. I can't show you the Innovation Africa video, but ladies and gents, that is why I believe in Zionism. That is why I do what I do. For my heritage's sake, for my nationality's sake, for my faith's sake, and for my now and for my future. Well, thank you, everybody. It was a blessing to be with you here tonight. Okay, I want to thank Olga, and I ask you to thank her as well for coming. And thank you all for listening, and we will see you in our next event. Thank you very much. Have a great night.